Well, have you ever watched one of those behind the scenes shows? You know, like those shows where uh, there's a, a documentary on how something big is pulled off. I watched one of those a while back on, on how a cruise ship operates. It was really cool. Uh, I've been on a cruise ship before, and you don't really notice all of the things that are kind of going on behind the scenes. But if you've ever been to one of these really, really kind of big events, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on behind the scenes. So many people doing so many things that I wouldn't have even thought needed to get done, but they need to get done. Uh, your house might feel like a cruise ship at times. There's all these things that need to happen, and somebody walks in, they have no idea how many things are kind of happening behind the scenes. I like these because you get to see all the different people that are doing all the different things. Jobs that you wouldn't even think existed, they exist, and you realize that they are essential. Better still than getting a behind-the-scenes uh, tour uh, you know, on the screen is actually getting one in person. Uh, a couple months ago, I was able to go with my one of my daughters on a field trip, and the field trip went to the Bell Center. Now, for me, as a Leafs fan, that's enemy territory, but still, I went with her, and and we got to see, you know, all of the things that are going on, how, how all the things that need to happen for a hockey game or a concert to take place, from the press box to the alumni lounge to ice level, we were walked through and told all about all that needed to get done so that a hockey game or a concert could take place. Now, what's the, what's the purpose of the Bell Center? It's, the purpose is to host big events, right? And who are the focus of those events? Well, it's the athletes or the performers. And once you've been given a behind-the-scenes tour, you never walk into one of those events or watch them on the screen the same way again. You have an appreciation for all of the things and the kind of dedication that needs to be poured, in, poured into the various jobs so that singularly focused, the main thing can be the main thing. And when we learn of those people, those people that do all of those jobs, there is an acknowledgement of their dedication. Now, those that work at the Bell Center or on a cruise ship aren't doing so for free. They get paid, right? These, these folks, they, they earn some pay. It may not be great all the time, but they do get paid. So while they're behind the works, behind the scenes work is admirable, it's not entirely selfless. But when you see someone volunteer, or even more, when you see someone pay out of their own pocket to support an effort, you get a real sense of this kind of like, wow, they must really believe in whatever it is they're giving themselves to. They must really think that this is so, so important. And if this is true of earthly things, think of how much truer this is of eternal things. When we learn of people who are doing all sorts of behind-the-scenes behind the scenes things because they want to make sure that the main thing can be the main focus. Today's passage is it's just three verses long. It's just three verses long, and, and you can find it in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. And it's one that highlights the necessity of such people, even naming some of them, and helps to remind us that what the main thing is and the means through which the main thing comes about. Now, unlike some of the other passages that we've tackled to date in Luke's gospel, this one maybe doesn't pack an overt punch at first reading. But I think if we consider it rightly, we'll likely feel some pressure and consider the importance of, of what I would call gospel patronage in a way that we haven't before. And as we do, I, I believe that there's something about the women we'll learn of that will help us have confidence in what they believe, what we believe to be true about Jesus. So if you're able with your Bible open to Luke chapter 8, let me invite you to stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Luke chapter 8. Afterward, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated as I pray. Father in, Father in heaven, we, uh, we ask that you use our time this morning 
to rejoice in the gospel and consider the beauty that exists in serving Jesus so that others might come to know him and be known by you. Do this by a work of the Spirit in our hearts and minds for our good and your glory, we pray. Amen. Well, just so we're clear, Jesus and the 12 is speaking of the disciples. Uh, these, these folks, Jesus and the 12, they, they weren't deadbeat dudes that were just kind of staying at home, couldn't hold a job, and were playing video games. Not at all. No, Jesus, as we're told in verse 1, you can look back there, is traveling from one town and village to another. What's he doing? He is preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The preaching and telling might read uh, proclaiming and preaching in the translation that you're using, depending on, on which Bible you're using this morning. The term proclaiming might be a more helpful term alongside preaching, as the Greek word in the text for telling and proclaiming is, is caruso, and it means publicly to publicly and authoritatively herald a message that must be listened to and obeyed. And it's not just any message. It is a message of significance, of great importance, because it's coming from an authority. And how is Jesus proclaiming? He's doing so through preaching. The Greek word that we have for preaching in our passage is euangelizo, and it's where we get our English word uh, evangelism, which is to share the good news. So the question is, what is the good news of the kingdom of God? If you're here and you are at all fuzzy on this, the good news is what we have been talking about each week and really should be the mark of any time that we have in the word together. The good news is that that God forgives repentant sinners. That is the good news, that God forgives repentant sinners. That if we follow our own way and our Lord over our own life, We live in a state of spiritual death now, and we will know the consequences of our choice eternally when we are judged by God and deemed guilty. But the good news is, should we repent and follow Jesus as Lord, our sins will be forgiven and we will live in a state of spiritual life now. And when we are judged by God, we will be deemed not guilty because we are ones who have placed our faith in Christ. And we will be seen as ones by God the Father as as who are in Christ. The perfection of Jesus will be credited to our account and our sin debt. All that we've racked up, and man, we have all racked up a lot, will be erased forever. If you've never considered this before, I would urge you to consider this now. And you can do so by considering your answer to the following question. Why should you be led into heaven? Why? If your answer begins with, because I, then I can tell you right away that you are on the wrong track. But if your answer begins with, because God, then at very least, I can tell you that you're pointed in the right direction. Because God the Father sent God the Son to live the sinless life that you and I have not lived and die the death that you and I rightfully should die by faith, I've been saved. And if you believe this, you will be saved as well. And this is the message that Jesus is preaching or proclaiming as he goes from place to place to place. And with him, looking back at at verse 1, you can see are the 12. The 12, we know, are the disciples. They're set apart from the others named in the passage. Now, while this sounds odd for us to follow a teacher around the way that we see the 12 doing, in Jesus' day, this this wasn't particularly a strange thing. But who Jesus has with him is. It was, it was a normative practice for a disciple of a rabbi or a teacher to live with him and, and learn under him, traveling when needed be. For the rabbi, their, their social clout or their credentials were boosted by the status of those who followed him. Sometimes we can see this even today in, in really silly ways when fame is attributed to a, to a pastor because a celebrity begins attending their church. Oy. <laughs> In the church, there's to be no celebrity pastor or parishioner alike. But the status of the 12 wasn't the kind of thing that gave Jesus a boost even in his day. If anything, these these uneducated, unattractive, feeble men show that the kingdom that Jesus was ushering in, it would be built on the strength that comes from God and not human ingenuity. In the months to come, this is something I'm really looking forward to, we're going to begin telling the stories of one another's lives. We're going to begin to hear how God has reached into death and saved us. There are going to be stories that reveal that that we're weak, 
that we can forget God's grace, that we struggle with sin, but that God is good, that he is gracious, that he is merciful, that he is slow to anger, and he is abounding in faithful love. So as these come out, I hope that you'll be encouraged by these stories. Now, as for the 12, none were among the elite or influential of Jewish society. Their ranks included no scribes, no Pharisees, no Sadducees, no priests, no rabbis, no synagogue rulers. They didn't come from wealthy or influential families, and they don't seem to have had any friends in high places. Uh, the 12, in fact, frequently displayed their, their weak faith and lack of insight. All of them abandoned Jesus in his hour of need. But Jesus poured his life into them and turned them into men who in time would turn the world upside down with the message that they brought. Now at this stage, you should know in the passage that we have, at this stage, the 12 had not yet been empowered or sent out to preach or teach or heal or cast out demons. That wasn't their gig just yet. They were observing. They were listening. They were learning. Only later would Jesus send them out on a preaching tour by themselves. And it's here that we're told something that, that none of the other Gospels mention. Well, all four of our Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, name women at the crucifixion and the resurrection, and each states that Jesus had female followers prior to the crucifixion. This is the only place, this is the only place where women are named as a group which traveled with Jesus to support his ministry. Now, it's not uncommon for, for women to support a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish historian named Josephus mentions this, but it was virtually unknown for women to travel with the rabbi. Like many in the ancient world, the rabbis had a very low view of women and they refused to teach them. And in his day, Jesus' engagement in the education of women was, was politically incorrect. That's not something you do. It flew in the face of conventional wisdom. Now, given the, the lowly status of women in Jewish society, they had very little influence that they could use to help him. But despite that, these women, they traveled with Jesus. They're not necessarily all of the time and not necessarily all of once, but these are the, some of the women that were named. The women we read of uh, had been healed spiritually of, of evil spirits and physically of sicknesses. Now, exactly how many women there were, we're not, we're not entirely sure, but Luke names three of them, right? You can see that in our text. And there were many others who followed Jesus as well. Like the other disciples, the addition of these women made Jesus socially unacceptable, which measured by rabbinical standards didn't put him on a really high plane. You look back to verse 2, just with your Bible open again, look back to verse 2 of chapter 8. You can see that, that some of the women that followed Jesus were, had, were ones that had been healed of sicknesses and had demons cast out from them. Apart from Mary, which is named, the text is unclear which of these things had been accomplished for which of the women named. But clearly, the women who made up this group that followed Jesus had experienced a miraculous encounter with Christ. Mary, who was called Magdalene after the, her hometown of Magdala on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, she figures prominently, actually, in the accounts of the Lord's death, of his burial, and of his resurrection. We probably know the most about her out of all of the women that are named. If you look to verse 3, Joanna is identified as, as the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. This would be the manager of Herod's household. Now, the Herod that's referred to here is Herod Antipas. He was the tetrarch of, of Galilee who imprisoned and executed John the Baptist. Remember when we talked about that? So the Jesus movement, those who are following Jesus, had, had made it into sort of the highest echelons of society. And so transformative was the, the message of the cross that it crossed economic lines that, such that the wife of, of a wealthy and important man would find herself worshiping alongside an important peasant, an unimportant peasant from Magdala and follow Jesus. The very man, her husband's boss, had John the Baptist beheaded on behalf of her. Suzanne is the final woman named, but, but nothing is actually known of her. So she's just a name that we know, kind of a sweet name that we use today, but we don't know anything else about her other than she followed Jesus and she gave of what she had. But we do know that each of the women supported the work of the gospel, which is evidence that they had been changed by the gospel. You see, Jesus' ministry depended on the small contributions of others whose lives he had changed. 
The disciples had had left everything to follow him, including their professions and their homes. Jesus himself, our scripture tells us, had, had nowhere to lay his head, and at his own death he owned nothing but the clothes he wore of which he was eventually stripped of as he hung on the cross. That said, that the meager contributions that, that they received were generous enough that Jesus and the Twelve were able to contribute to the poor that they came into contact with. At least, it seems that they made that a priority when they had even little themselves. So the question is this morning, three verses. They don't seem to tell us a ton. What are we to do with this? Why should we mention the women and their actions of giving? Why should that mean anything for us today? Well, I think it speaks to us as a church, as a group of people, about our use of money, and I believe that it challenges us as individuals to consider where our heart is really situated concerning our money and our time. Uh, Obviously, to do this, to talk about this, we're going to need to talk about money, and as I've said in the past, money can kind of be a touchy topic in church, mainly because it's not always been handled well. Church history includes stories of people being manipulated for money or or money being misused. My take on talking about money and preaching is to do so when our text does, and I think our text today rightfully allows us to ask some questions of us as a church and us as individuals, which I will do now. Now, I'll give one caveat before I do. Uh, If you're not a Christian, how we talk about our money as Christians should sound really weird to you. And I'll tell you why. Firstly, because Christians don't own things. We steward things. Ultimately, Christians believe that what what we own is God's, and we're to use the money that we have with, with God's glory in mind. Secondly, generosity is to be one of the main markers of how a Christian manages their money. It's like God gives us money to take care of and then says, the way I want you to take care of the money that I'm going to give you is to go and be as generous as possible and bless as many people as possible with it. So what what are we to do with all of this? I think there are two dangers as a church how we can think about our ministry and money. Maybe this is uh, particularly timely for us as we have a members meeting tonight where we'll actually be talking about our budget. So in God's providence, he has us here this morning. In dealing with ministries and resources, we can champion two equally dangerous imbalances in the church. First, we can look at ministries as simply a matter of of throwing money at a need. But ministry without heart, even well-financed ministry, is not ministry in God's eyes. A ministry can possess the best equipment, the finest quality of building, and the largest an email list to send out to and still not be doing God's work with quality if, if people and adherence to God's word are not more important. There are, there are churches, if you've been around church any length of time, there are churches that have lost their effectiveness and their testimony of being known as Christians that love one another because they have developed a reputation of caring more about programs and buildings than they have people. That ought not to be us. Uh, Our family has been a part of ministries in, in, in in all honesty, the poorer countries in the world where the buildings and the facilities have left much to be desired. (laughs) But there's a heart for Jesus in the ministry such that the people are cared for as a matter of priority and how God's glory is made known. So throwing money at a ministry and paying others to do the church's work might make it look nice, but it's ministry that's divorced from the heart. And if that's the case, it's not ministry that looks good in God's eyes. The second danger is this. The opposite error is to argue that, that resources don't matter at all and they're, they're better left just not talked about. I don't think Scripture does that for us. The passage we have before us today tells us that there were needs and that the women met the needs and others did. Uh, Paul, in various discussions of resources, shows that money is important. It's an important aspect of ministerial stewardship for us as a church. And as a church, applying our financial resources to support the gospel, how it's proclaimed, how we let other people know the good news, and the care of God's people ought to be our highest concern. And it's consistent with what we'd want for ourselves. Simply stated, there's there's a history of thought within some streams of the Christian church that think if you keep a, a ministry worker poor, you keep them pious. 
I'll say this, there is no scriptural basis for such a position. And if it's actually worked out in practice, it goes counter to the very directive that the church is given to provide for those who labor among them, particularly those who give themselves to the teaching of the word. Now, I say that with some sensitivity because I stand before you today as someone who, who earns their keep from the giving of the church. But as I read this passage this week, I realized, wow, this is for me as well. This is done so that gospel workers can be fully focused on the work at hand and not distracted, in all reality, with having to keep another job. It's really that simple. Now, of course, the ability of a people to support a gospel worker among them will differ from people to people, but, but where the ability exists, it's, it's to be expressed generously and received gratefully. And this extends even to the missionaries that we support. So one of the things that we've begun to do as, as elders is to think through, and we're on the front end of this, but is to think through how we can better support our missionaries who are reliant upon churches, and our churches specifically, for their pay. We're working on thinking through various aspects of care for our missionaries, but one of the pieces of that is financial. So as a church, we don't want to be a people who simply throws money at ministries without engaging in them ourselves, and we don't want to be a people who stick our head in the sand when it comes to the finances of the church either. But of course, any group, any group is made up of individuals. And this is where I think we can look to the women and intent, who intentionally supported the gospel work with their money and their time. If you look back to verse 3 of what we have today, we see that, that, both gave, that they gave of both their money and their time. Now, it's not exclusively women who supported the work financially, but, it's, but I think it's noteworthy that, that only women are specifically named in doing so among the many others who supported them from their possessions. So let's start with money because I think uh, time will naturally flow uh, out of where we choose to spend our money. Jesus made the point many times and in many ways. He did so in the Sermon on the Plain, and it's one that we've looked at here, he, where he exhorted a large multitude of people. He said, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In the Sermon on the Mount, he likewise cautioned, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think these, these words actually ought to uh, be a word of conviction, exhortation, or in some way haunt every reader with a job, especially ones who, like me, or who, like us, are among the wealthiest people in the history of the world. In a recent uh, Forbes article, an uh, economist calculated that the average Westerner today is much richer, get this, roughly 90 times richer than the average individual throughout the entirety of history past. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What a word for us in a season of affluent disciples. And here, the, the stats don't lie. Uh, I'm going to read a couple things, and hopefully we can track together on them. I'll look to unpack them a bit. Uh, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity reports that the total income of Christians worldwide in 2022, so this is fairly recent, is now $53 trillion. That's a number that's too big for me. I don't even know what that means. But $53 trillion. How much do we spend on Christian causes per year? The number they that they calculated was... 896 billion, so that's less than 2% of our income. So less than 2%. Trillions and billions uh, are numbers that are, honestly, they're too big for me. I don't even know what those numbers mean. So I'm going to use a few smaller ones for us just to make this a little more helpful. According to a recent poll, 19% of evangelicals, that's those defined by their belief in the authority of Scripture, the importance of evangelism, uh, talking about penal substitutionary atonement, and gospel exclusivity gave no money whatsoever to any church or any charity. And among those with, with six-figure incomes, 10% gave nothing within the past 12 months. And those who did donated 4% of their income to churches and charities. 
So bear in mind that these numbers are inflated by a small group of very big givers. The median figure is actually far worse. Now, the median is the number where you have half, half of the givers, half the number would be above, and half the number would be below. And that number, the median number, is 1%, which means half of evangelicals give less than 1% of their income to any gospel work or any charity. As if this weren't enough to convince us of the need to improve, uh, the Barna Group reports that younger Christians give at even a lower rate than did their predecessors. Uh, this has yielded what has come to be known as a generosity gap, and that doesn't bode well for gospel work. Well, how do we stack up as individuals? And when I say we, I mean us, the people of Hudson Community Baptist Church. And I understand we have visitors here, so this probably is, don't, don't hear this as being for you. How do we stack up as a church, as a people? Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what people give or even who gives. That's just not my, that's not my department. But to, think, to make this meaningful for us, and you know the number in your own mind, I pulled the average median income, household income, for Hudson, St. Lazare, Rigaud, and Vaudreuil, and this is before taxes. Now, before I give you the number, we're all kind of waiting, what, what's that number? Of course, not every household income is at this level. Some households earn more, some much more, and some will earn less, some much less. But here's, here's the number, pre-tax, uh, the average, uh, the median income, uh, household income pre-tax in these four areas, and that is, it's $90,000. That's what it is. Again, some earn less and some earn more, but, but let's just say this, that even if that number were much, much lower, it is more than enough among us to meet all of our needs and to allow us to be generous with churches that don't have as much as we do and support gospel workers in other places. But we have, God has given us more than we need. Now, over and over again in Scripture, the Lord says that uh, our giving is an indicator of our trust in God and his providential care for his people day by day. In giving, it's not us paying God back. No, no, that's, that's wrong labor, that's wrong thinking. You can never pay God back for his grace. That, that wouldn't be grace, would it? But it's one of the ways that we can all participate in making the main thing be the main thing, which is the gospel being made known. Now, the ancient Israelites practiced uh, fiscal stewardship with care, at least some of the time, uh, through their giving history. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there, there would be seasons of change when what they were required or asked of would be a bit different. Uh, but within the Mosaic law, it required a tithe, an offering of the people year by year. A primary tithe, which means 10%, was given of crops and cattle, there were propitiatory offerings, that's for their sin or their guilt. There were dedicatory offerings, and these were for various kinds and various reasons. There were communal offerings for fellowship and, and peace and thanksgiving and sacred vows that would be taken. And all of these gifts honored the Lord. They supported the Levites as well. That's the tribe from, the, from where the priests came. They funded corporate worship in the tabernacle and the temple, and they met the needs of the poor among them. Different scholars uh, calculate this a bit differently. But it's likely between 20 and 26% of, of what they brought in would be what they gave out. Now, in the New Testament, as one's post-cross for us as Christians, the implied expectation of giving, it was relaxed somewhat as the Gentile Christians, as new Christians came on and said, what is this giving all about? It's clear that, that there's no number. There's no 10% number that's required. But the, the teaching of the apostles on stewardship and giving proved to be just as robust and even actually more aspirational. Paul admonished the Corinthians concerning his collection for the Jerusalem saints. Remember, he's collecting money for someone else somewhere else who is in need. He said, whoever, spares, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And the direction is this. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul said much of the same to his, his mentee, a, 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 younger, a younger leader named Timothy. And Timothy seems to be a guy who maybe struggled with timidity in some ways. He said this to him, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, 
nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly, truly life. So the response of Christians in giving is rooted actually in their love for Jesus. It's something that they've thought about, and they, it's just something that they've come to an amount in their mind, and they're settled on in their heart, and then they do so gladly because they consider the outworking of the gospel gift, meaning because they understand the value of their own salvation. So think together. the value. If you are a Christian, what have you been saved of? And you realize that it is of unmeasurable worth. They understand the value of their salvation, and so they give that others will be sent to proclaim that same gospel through which is the only message that people can be saved. Now, the women specifically gave of their money, but they also gave of their time. They spent time doing the things that needed to get done so that the main thing could remain the main thing. While we're given the names of uh, three women, all of those who gave themselves to following Jesus Everyone began doing so without any kind of title. You might say that they were all the errand runners of Christ. Uh, There's a Kenyan pastor named uh, Peter Maturi who, who I enjoy reading. He says this, The body of Christ needs people who are willing and ready to roll up their sleeves and do the things that need to get done. It needs those available to serve in any and every way, not just those with specific giftings or experience, so that the main thing can remain the main thing. The church needs people to be available for what is called the ministry of presence, filling the gaps as they notice them, ready to serve. And and our willingness ought to precede giftedness. In fact, often it's this willingness that reveals our gifting. And this is where we see that the service that supports gospel work is beautiful whether it's stacking chairs or handing out Bibles or serving in the nursery or shoveling the steps or sweeping up a mess that's been made, there's a beauty in doing the things that need to get done so that the main thing can remain the main thing. There is no job that is small or insignificant. Every is essential in the kingdom of God. And this is where I think we ought to be careful that our particular gifting doesn't define us I often find that people who label themselves with a a particular gifting early on, they're closing the door for other areas of service. And in the end, it it could actually lead them to to walking around with empty titles when what the local church needs is for them to do whatever is needed. God's church needs all kinds of sermons for all kinds of ministries. It's actually a tragedy if everyone in a team thinks and serves like everyone else. In God's construction of his church, we find that all kinds of people with all kinds of abilities uh, are needed, and there's lots of opportunity within the kingdom of God. I actually think if if we were to set aside titles and abilities, we would realize just how much we are needed in even this small expression of Christ's kingdom. We would see beyond ourselves to the vast harvest all around us. We wouldn't shy away from service on account of specific gifting. Instead, we would discover just how gifted we are as a church. Well, it's just three verses, right? Just three verses about Jesus doing what Jesus came to do and people who supported him through giving both time and money. Some are named, but the majority are not in Scripture. But but what we do know is that those who provided for the proclamation of the gospel to take place did so because they had been forgiven by Jesus. And knowing how good it is to be forgiven by Jesus, they wanted others to know that goodness as well. So, So I think what you and I get to walk away with today is this. Knowing that there is nothing greater than knowing Jesus, how are you thinking about and giving of whatever funds God has given you to steward to see that the gospel that has saved you saves others. How are you thinking about your time to that end? And does your heart reflect a joyful willingness to serve the cause of Christ as you are able? In increasing measure, as a testimony of what Jesus has done, may these things mark in increasing measure your life and mine and that of us as Hudson Community Baptist Church. Let me lead us in prayer. Father in heaven, our prayer is that we would 
be a people who consider the gospel that has saved us and so, and so love the lost that we would gladly give of what you have entrusted to us for its furtherance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.